week was a special Sunday, and we kind of took a step aside from our study through the book of Exodus, so I've been excited to get back into it. Today we're in Exodus 19, so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. If you didn't bring one, we have the new Bibles in the back. Feel free to grab one of those as well. Um, But as we get ready to jump into chapter 19, I'm wondering if you have ever had one of those experiences where you maybe meet somebody or you're in somebody's presence and it's completely overwhelming. Like you don't know what to say, so you start saying stupid stuff. And so maybe your first encounter with this was maybe in middle school and that really pretty girl across the cafeteria and you finally get the nerve or you bump into her in the hallway and you're like, and you say something dumb. Maybe it happened for you in college. Maybe you got to meet the CEO of your company and you had been waiting for that day and you had it all prepared what you were gonna say or the pitch you were gonna give. And when you had the opportunity in the elevator, you choked because you got so nervous. I was reminded of a pastor buddy who, um, he's a talker, great guy, but lots of energy, go-getter. And um, he one time had the opportunity to host Shaq, like the Shaquille O'Neal at an event, and it's kind of a long story, maybe some of you remember this, but he came to a church uh, for an event, and so my buddy had kind of set it all up, he was the host, they had to uh, rent a chair that would hold Shaq, and so the chair gets delivered on a big truck, and like, the stage was set, everything was ready, so Shaq arrives, and, and my buddy, who like, has no problem talking, no problem talking, he goes up and meets Shaq, and he goes, dude, I was speechless. He's like, I shook the man's hand, and it just engulfed me. He goes, I was terrified. So we have experiences like this. Maybe you've met or been in the presence of, like, a superstar, and you've gotten starstruck, whether it's a musician or an actor or somebody, and, and you just had nothing to say in those moments. You're like, these are just people. And the old saying, like, they put their pants on the same way, one leg at a time. But yet, somehow, we get in the presence of certain people, and we're just overwhelmed, and we kind of lose all sense. Maybe a little bit more, um, I don't know, maybe this is a more right way to be overwhelmed is by nature. Maybe if you've ever been to Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon, and you see the wonders of God's creation, and you stand on the edge of that thing, and you're just like, I got nothing. Or maybe you've seen some of these presentations on YouTube or you've heard somebody talk about how big the universe actually is. Have you seen these comparisons like they, like here's Earth and then they zoom out and they show you how much bigger the other planets are and how minuscule we are in the scope of the universe. And you see that and you're like. And we are overwhelmed, rightly so in those times. And we are speechless and don't know how to respond. And so today, in this passage, which is kind of odd, there's, it's kind of a weird experience that God's people have in the wilderness. Um, they're going to encounter God in a, in a unique way. And it's going to overwhelm them. And they're going to kind of freeze. Now, throughout the history of the church, God's people have usually emphasized either his transcendence or his eminence. And what I mean by that is transcendence, one way of talking about it is like it's, it's how big and how so high above and how different God is from us. Like he is just unattainable, indescribable, infinite, all-powerful. He is transcendent. He's just up there and out there. And so some expressions of the body of Christ now and throughout the ages have really held up in a, in a faithful way the transcendence of God. Like he is holy, You know, holy is a word we throw around a lot in church and like, oh, holy, holy, holy. And we sing songs and talk about how God is holy. Holy, one definition of it is other than. When we talk about God, God alone is holy. He is completely other other than. There is no one and nothing and nobody like him. He is made up, if you will, of something completely different than us. He has no beginning or no end. He is the only thing that has not been created. So right there, he is separate from all that is. All that we know and comprehend has been created. God has no beginning. Nothing and nobody created him. He is other than. And so he is transcendent. But he at the same time is also eminent. And and eminence is that God is close to us. He came to us in Jesus, as we've already said so many times today. 
He's with us everywhere by his spirit. He is involved in every aspect of our lives. In him we live and move and have our being. In him all things hold together. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Amen? And so we live in this tension of his transcendence and his eminence, that he is so far above and other than us, and yet he has become one of us and is with us in our lives. Both are true. And so this is a really good tension that I hope we never lose. And so depending on the expression of the body of Christ you grew up in, maybe you're like, I get it. Like I grew up in this church and they definitely emphasized how much greater God was than us. And we were just worms and he was like huge and holy. And like you didn't make a peep when you came into church. And it was just very reverent. If that's your experience, maybe in some ways you've reacted a little bit against that and you've gone the other way. But maybe there's part of you that says, man, I wish we had a little bit more of that. I will say for myself, I tend, and if you didn't notice, I'm a little bit more on the God is imminent side. He is with us. But there are parts of other churches, I mean, like, man, there is a holiness and a reverence and an awe that I need more of. And again, we live in this tension. I remember... This was a long time ago at this point, but these t-shirts started going around. Some of you will remember this. I think we have a slide. Remember this, Jesus is my homeboy? Even that's too far for me. I never had one of those. If you did, I'm not judging you. But that just kind of depicts what I'm talking about. Like, God's people wouldn't even say or write his name. And then now we wear t-shirts that say, Jesus is my homeboy. He's transcendent and he's imminent. And so today we're going to see how God's people wrestle through that and how they get a bigger picture of how God is bigger than them and yet with them, all right? So Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, here we go. Israel at Sinai, in the third month from the very day the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim, came to the Sinai wilderness, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. So it's making it very clear, like, okay, they've moved, and now they're setting up camp in Sinai. Now, what is really, really interesting about this is that tells us right there that God has made good on one of his promises. If you remember back to Exodus chapter 3, when Moses is out minding his own business, he's watching his father-in-law's sheep, he's up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, And that is when God appears to him in the burning bush and speaks to him and says, I want you to go to Egypt and get my people out of there. And so Exodus 3, we've got this on the slide. Uh, Exodus 3.11 says, But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God answered, I will certainly be with you. Listen. And this will be the sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Fast forward, it's all happened, and now they are back at that mountain preparing to worship God. God made good on his promise. He is always faithful. That had to be an amazing encouragement to Moses. Like, I see, wait a minute, I see what you're doing. I remember that bush over there. And look, now I got two million people behind me. God, you have done this great thing. Verse three, Moses went up the mountain to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you, you are to say to the Israelites. And so the section here where God is speaking, scholars tell us that this is very legal language. It's legal language of the day that God is using as he engages with Moses on the top of the mountain. He is reaffirming his covenant to his people. He is doubling down on what he promised Abraham back in Jesus in Genesis chapter 12. And so in verse four, he's reminding them of what he has done for them, right? Verse four, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians, Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And so some of you have, have heard this before. Some of you know this, that eagles, when they raise their young, they'll let them stay in the nest for about 100 days, and then they start stirring the nest to kick them out of the nest. And the little baby eaglets, I think they're called, I don't know, they bump them out of the nest. The eagle's like, ah, 
fall, kind of like Looney Tunes, they fall out of the nest, and the eagle is trying to teach them how to fly. And as the eagles, baby eagles are falling through the sky, plummeting to earth, the big eagle, the mama eagle or the daddy, I don't know which one, maybe they both do it, will swoop down and catch that baby eagle on its back. That is the imagery here that God is the one that has caught them and carried them out of Egypt. Now what's really interesting, man, this is early in the Bible, this is early in God's people's history. That metaphor, that picture comes up a few other places in scripture. They keep pointing back to this imagery. And what's really cool is that the Lord has picked something out of his creation to give them an image of his care for them. So obviously the Israelites had seen eagles do this. I don't know if they had eagles in Egypt or whatever, but apparently they did because he chooses this example to give them. I thought that was really cool. I had never thought about it before. Like this is where that originates with the Lord. This is the first time in scripture he uses that picture with his people that I will carry you on eagle's wings. And now look at what he says. He says, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to the promised land and brought you to heaven and brought you to that new car. What's he say? I brought you to myself. Spoiler alert. God's purpose and plan for each one of us is to bring you to himself. He's going to bring them to a literal promised land, but that ain't the whole shebang. That's just a tiny, imperfect taste of what he has ultimately prepared for them and for each one of us. The promised land is Jesus himself. You have to keep coming back every week to get the whole end of the story, but that's, that's the end. It's Jesus. How I carried you on eagle's wings to myself. That is the whole point. And then in verse 5, he says, now, if you'll carefully listen to me and keep my covenant. And so they hadn't done anything to be chosen by God, right? All the way back in Genesis 12, when God comes to Abraham and says, you're going to be my people. It was of no virtue on their own. It's simply because God said, you're mine. And so he's reminding them, I'm calling you to be faithful. And, and, and you being faithful will prove that I've chosen you. But it wasn't your faithfulness or your efforts or your good deeds that had me choose you in the first place. That was on me. Verse six, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. He's saying that he will use these Israelite people wandering in the desert. He's gonna use them to be a testimony to all the people of the earth. A priest is a mediator, right? A priest is one hand on God, one hand on the people. He's the go-between. He listens to the Lord, speaks it to the people, listens to the people, speaks it to the Lord. That's the role of a priest. And God is saying, you, my people Israel, are gonna be a nation of priests between me and all the other peoples of the earth. That is my plan for you. And that is exactly what he promised Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, when he said, all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Israelites, you are my chosen priests. Through you, I'm going to bless all the other different kinds of people of the earth. And we know, ultimately, who is that fulfilled in? Jesus. And Jesus was what? A Jew. He was an Israelite. It was through this people group that God drew all people to himself. And so this is the deal. You, we read those three verses. He's reaffirming his covenant to them. And look at the language. Look at the pronouns here throughout. And I've got this on the screen too. Listen, to, I, what I did, how I carried you, brought you to myself. Listen to me. Keep my covenant. You will be my own. The whole earth is mine. You will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Doesn't it seem a little one-sided? Doesn't he seem to be all about himself? It's because he is. Because remember, he is other than. Only he is God and only he deserves it and only he can accomplish what he's purposed for his purposes. He's the one that initiated and he is the one that is holding up both sides of this covenant, both sides of this deal, both sides of this contract. He is the one. In John 15, 16, Jesus told his disciples just hours before the cross, he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. 
And that's true of all of us. Like we said last week, we were all helpless, wandering sheep who had all gotten ourselves in trouble. And it's only because of the love and mercy and grace of our good shepherd that he came to rescue us for our benefit and for his glory. Verse seven, we're gonna keep moving. After Moses came back, so he's been up on the mountain with the Lord, he's, he's received this reaffirmation from the Lord. After Moses came back, he summoned the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people responded together, we will do all that the Lord has spoken. It's very optimistic of them. We're there all the time. The words that we sing, Lord, I love you with my whole heart. Everything, every breath that I breathe is you. It's good. The spirit of God, is it strong in us? The flesh is weak. Even back then, we're wrestling with the same thing. We will do all that the Lord has spoken. So Moses brought the people's words back to the Lord. He's like, God, they're in. And so the Lord says, here's what I'm gonna do. Look at verse nine. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me when I speak with you and will always believe you. And Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. Now, if you're reading this fast, you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. But did you catch, I'm gonna come to you in a dense cloud. And so here in this, in this thing that God's gonna do, he's exhibiting that he's both imminent. You're gonna see me. You're gonna see this physical thing of, of my presence. You're gonna be able to say like, oh, I think the Lord's here. And you're gonna hear it. All the people are gonna hear God speaking to Moses. So it's, it's a very imminent thing. He is with them. But the very fact that it's a cloud shows his transcendence because no man could conjure that up. God is transcendent and imminent. He said, I'm gonna come to you in this dark, dense cloud. And the other thing that's beautiful here, it says, well, why is he doing this? Why would God do this? And God tells him why. So that the people will hear when I speak with you and will always believe you. Because he knows the people's tendency is to not believe Moses and to doubt God, and to grumble, and to complain. And so God, once again, is moving toward his people, saying, I'm gonna give you a couple signs here to prove that it's me who is speaking to Moses. Now, uh, Moses, if this wouldn't have happened, it would have been easy for for the people to say, oh, Moses just went up on the mountain and he made up all of these rules for us. Because that's what's coming next is the Ten Commandments. Like, they could have been like, Moses just got us all out of Egypt with God's help, but now he's gonna like set up his kingdom and give us all these rules and try to control us. And God's anticipating that. So no, you're gonna know that I'm the one who is speaking to Moses to speak to you. And so now it's time to prepare for the Lord's coming and listen to these instructions. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 10, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. They must wash their clothes And be prepared by the third day, for on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Holy cow. And so consecrate means to set apart as holy. It's the other than, like this is something we don't use for other things. Maybe your mom growing up had the special china. In a way, that's kind of holy. It is set apart only for a specific purpose. And if you grew up in a home like that, you never used it, right? Like the special purpose never came. But God is saying, I am gonna come to you in three days. Consecrate yourselves. Clean yourselves. This is a day unlike any other day. This is gonna be a special moment that you need to prepare on the outside something tactile and tangible so that it will get hopefully into your hearts on the inside that you will recognize there's something going on here. Prepare yourselves for the coming of the Lord. And so maybe uh, you grew up in a tradition where you really celebrated Lent. That's the whole purpose of Lent is we deny ourselves physical things, physical pleasures, so that our hearts are stirred and prepared to celebrate Jesus and what he did for us. Um, Growing up, some nights on Saturday nights, uh, my dad would say, no TV tonight. And his reason was to begin to prepare our hearts for church the next morning to begin thinking and and setting your minds and your hearts on other things in preparation. If you get our Sunday morning email, at the end of every email, I tell you the passage for today and I say, take a few minutes to begin to prepare your hearts to worship, to set aside some time, a holy time, a consecrated time, to begin getting our minds and our hearts in a place where we're ready to come to worship together. 
That's what the Lord is saying. He's giving them instruction. These people have been in the desert, in the wilderness. How many of you know they're not taking showers? They're in the desert. They're not cleaning their clothes. So to clean their clothes and to get cleaned up for whatever's going to happen in three days took a lot of effort. It was very succinctly communicating to them, this is a big deal. Consecrate yourselves. Verse 12. Put boundaries for the people all around the mountain and say, be careful that you don't go up on the mountain or touch its base. Anyone who touches the mountain must be put to death. No hand may touch him. So if somebody touches the mountain, the guy's got to die. They're saying, don't touch him even to kill him. Listen, instead, he will be stoned or shot with arrows and not live, whether animal or human. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up the mountain. Kind of odd, right? What's happening? Put boundaries for the people all around the mountain. And so as I read that, I was like, no, he's, he's literally saying, like, rope off the mountain. And so here's a picture of what came to mind. Like, seriously. So I can just picture Moses coming down and saying, hey, Joshua, Aaron, her, we got some work to do. We have to physically put up boundaries around this mountain because this is a big deal. If somebody even accidentally touches the base of this mountain, they have to die. That is how holy and transcendent our God is. And he's about to come visit us in a unique way. And we're not going to mess with that. Put up boundaries to keep the people back. And he says this thing there, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up the mountain. And so that's the cue that it's okay to then approach the Lord's presence is when you hear that trumpet, when you hear that horn, that's the signal. Remember that. Verse 14. Then Moses came down from the mountain to the people and consecrated them and they washed their clothes. He said to the people, be prepared by the third day. Do not have sexual relations with women. Now, this does not mean that sexual relations with your spouse is wrong or sinful in any way. It was another way of preparing. It was another way of fasting. It was another way to put away physical pleasures to begin to prepare our hearts for what God is going to do. And so the Apostle Paul reflects this same principle in his instruction to the married couples in the church in in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Paul says, don't deprive one another, married couples, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. We will abstain from that to intentionally stir our affection and heart for the Lord. That's what is happening here. So preparation has been made. It's go time. Verse 16. On the third day, when morning came, there was thunder and lightning. I want you to use your imagination. Some of you haven't used your imagination since kindergarten. It's okay. We're going to exercise it a little here. Would you just close your eyes and listen to the description in this verse? So they've done all this cleaning up. They've they've gone through the trouble of cleaning their clothes as best they could and washing up and abstaining from certain things in anticipation of the third day. The third day comes, and picture this. When morning came, there was thunder and lightning. If you've been in a thunder and lightning storm, it is unsettling. I think thunder and lightning set on purpose by God in a moment like this is probably exceptionally terrifying. Thunder and lightning, but there's no mention of rain. It's just loud and bright. And it just so happens to be on the day when they were told God is gonna visit you. Keep using your imagination. A thick cloud on the mountain And so now this cloud is all around the mountain. And a very loud blast from a ram's horn so that all the people in the camp shuddered. And so this is a supernatural horn blast. This isn't one of Moses' dudes just over in the corner. This is a horn blast from heaven. In the midst of thunder and lightning and a thick cloud around this huge mountain, it's so loud that up to two million people shudder. Imagine the noise of two million people. Imagine the noise of the thunder and the lightning. But this trumpet or this horn blasts, and it is terrifying. 
God is transcendent. He is using the uncontrollable elements of nature that we have no control of. He's using those to also communicate his eminence that he is there with them in that moment. Now what? Are they, are they just gonna run up the mountain? They heard the horn, that was the cue. Time to go! Verse 17, then Moses brought the people out of the camp, so kind of around those fences, to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And so just picture them looking up, the thick cloud enveloping the mountain. Thunder and lightning happen, and they hear this loud horn, and they're standing there, and they're supposed to be walking up the mountain at this point. Mount Sinai, verse 18, was completely enveloped in smoke. So now you have that. The mountain is completely enveloped in smoke. Why? Because the Lord came down on it in fire. The bush was nothing compared to this. You have a whole mountain where the Lord has come down on fire and the whole mountain is now smoking with this loud noise, thunder and lightning going on and they're supposed to go up the mountain. And listen to this, the whole mountain shook violently. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm running up that mountain. It's full of fire and thunder and lightning and it's shaking. Verse 19. As the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, it's almost like the Lord is saying, hey guys, this is your cue. Because remember verse 13, he told them, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they may go up the mountain. And so now it says it's getting louder and louder, like, hello, come on, this is your chance. People are all like, nope. Later, King David will write in Psalm 24, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Like, who dares to ascend where he is? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And I think looking around at the base of that mountain that day, they're like, I ain't doing it. And so it seems like Moses realizes nobody's gonna step out. Nobody's gonna step out in faith. Even the Lord had told him, when you hear the horn, that's your time to go. He sees that they are just overcome with terror. And so somehow Moses musters the courage to speak. And I, I, it doesn't say, I'm kind of guessing Moses kind of says something like, uh, Lord, now what? They're not moving because look at verse 20. Then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai. So something different happens here. He had been present with the fire. That was evident, evidence of his presence. And yet now it says the Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. The Lord directed Moses, go down and warn the people not to break through to see the Lord. Like, don't cross those lines now. Don't cross the barriers. Don't cross the fences now. That ship has sailed. Warn them not to break through to see the Lord. Otherwise, many of them will die. Even the priests who come near the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out in anger against them. Moses responded to the Lord, the people cannot come out Mount Sinai since you warned us, put a boundary around the mountain and consecrate it. Moses is like, we put up a fence, like they ain't coming. We're pretty good at building fences. And the Lord replied to him, go down and come back with Aaron. But the priests and the people must not break through to come up to the Lord or he will break out in anger against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So there's a change of plans. The people didn't come up when the Lord invited them to come up. And so now the Lord's come down in a, in a it seems like a more personal way that he's on the top of the mountain now and invites Moses to come up and talk. He says, they're not to come up now. And he says, 
Bring Aaron with you. And next week we're going to see this is when God speaks his law to his people. While Moses is on the mountain. And she's like, dude, this is a really strange passage. And yet it sets the stage for the interactions to come, that God's people need to have this mediator. Moses has been the go-between between God and his people, God and the Egyptians, for a while now. And that's going to become incredibly important. Someone who will communicate with God and communicate his heart to his people. Moses right now is uh, that role. He's in that role, but this is just a temporary role because we know that Moses himself is not pure and sinless. He isn't fully qualified to be in this role. And so you and I are the terrified people at the base of that mountain. Whether we know it or not, we don't have a chance of approaching God. And so we need a mediator to go up that mountain and encounter God on our behalf. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses is once again pointing us to a mediator that we need for eternity, one who will come to stand in the gap. Jesus is our only hope, our only chance. He is our infinitely transcendent God who became human. He took on flesh. He became Emmanuel, God with us, and he kept the half of the covenant that we could never keep for us. And so as we close, I want to read you a few verses from Hebrews 12, all the way to, toward the end of the New Testament, where Jesus has already come, his apostles and the, the church knows what Jesus accomplished and what he did. And so the writer of Hebrews recalls this event that we just read all the way back here at Exodus. Generations and generations later, Hebrews recalls this event at Mount Sinai and gives a warning to those who haven't turned to Jesus as their only mediator. As we've been reminded of his transcendence, we're like, we need somebody imminent. This is what he writes. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet. He's describing all the things we just read. And the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn, whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all. You have come to the spirits of the righteous people made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. There's so much in here. See to it that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they rejected him who warned them on the earth, even less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he was promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. We know that he's speaking about when Jesus returns, that when he comes once and for all with justice and judgment for the wicked to those who have not responded to him, who have not come to him in faith, who have not trusted in the one and only mediator between us and God, he is saying the transcendent one will come and you will be done. Don't ignore his voice today. Let's bow. Jesus, for each one of us, Would you speak to us by your spirit even now as we are quiet before you, as we have heard these reminders of your power, your transcendence, that you are a holy God, that, that nothing and no one can approach you who isn't pure. 
But as we've also been reminded that time and time again throughout Scripture, you are the one that took initiative to move toward your people and to make every provision for us to be in relationship face-to-face with you. And so, Lord, for those of us here today who have a really hard time understanding your eminence, that you are with us, and we see you as kind of aloof and off in space, and you kind of set things up and kind of let us go, and you say you love us, but we don't really feel that. Lord, I pray for those who have such a high transcendent view of you that they cannot grasp your love for them in the details and struggles of their lives. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would just warm them with your love right now that they would know that you see them, you care about them, that you are here with them. Lord, for those of us who have become so casual in our relationship with you that we take our sin lightly, that we sin and it doesn't grieve us because it grieves your heart. Lord, we know that you call us to come before your throne boldly and we do that, but oftentimes, Lord, it's not because of we're so appreciative of the blood of Jesus is because we've just gotten callous and casual. Lord, would you convict us of that? Would you stir in us more in an awe and awe and reverence for who you are? God, we want to be a church where we don't try to bring you down on our level and we don't want to be a people who try to strive to be on your level. But Lord, may we hold in proper attention the awe and respect that you deserve and also experience the love of our Heavenly Father in Jesus who came as Emmanuel. Jesus, fill us once again with your spirit today. Lord, may your love and power in our hearts motivate us to continue to move towards you in faith as you have moved toward us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna see. Several months ago, we went through the book of 1 Peter. And so Peter references back to this time where the Lord says, you're gonna be my people, my treasured possession. And so as our blessing today, hear the words of 1 Peter chapter two. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who calls you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, you are carriers and recipients of the mercy of God. And so go in that as your encouragement and your strength this week. Amen.